Hello and welcome back to the Fall of the Roman Empire. My name is Nick Holmes and this is episode 22 called Tetrarchs and Christians. In the last episode, we heard about Diocletian's new tax system, which was very successful, and his attempts to stop the rampant inflation in the late 3rd century, which was unfortunately for him a lot less successful. But nevertheless, his tax reform started to make the Roman state solvent again which was, in my view, a major turning point in solving the crisis of the 3rd century. But Diocletian did not stop there. He was a man of extraordinary energy. And in this episode, I want to cover the two other major features of his reign, which were first the Tetrarchy, which was the rule of four co-emperors. Now, this was the most famous event in his reign, and you can't really talk about Diocletian without talking about the Tetrarchy. But there's also another vitally important subject which we need to cover, which was his persecution of the Christians. Now, the Christians haven't been a big feature of this podcast so far, but now they're going to take centre stage because it was in the 3rd and 4th centuries that one of the biggest things happened in world history, which was that the Roman state became Christian. Now, if you think about it, that was a truly extraordinary occurrence because we all know that the Romans had gods like Jupiter, Pluto, Venus, Mars, etc. So how did they decide to abandon those and take up Christianity? And that's a subject we'll cover in the next episode. But at this point, I just want to say that the Christians were becoming more and more important in the 3rd century, and this provoked hostility at first from the Roman state. And Diocletian was probably the worst of the Roman emperors in persecuting the Christians. So we'll also cover that in this episode. So without further ado, let's get on with both the Tetrarchy and Diocletian's treatment of the Christians. Hope you enjoy it. If you go to St Mark's Basilica in Venice, you will find a sculpture of the Tetrarchs fixed to a corner of the facade that really provides the most meaningful insight we have into Diocletian's mentality. I'm sorry I can't show you a picture of this, but I'm working on a website, so I will put a picture on that in due course. But in the meantime, if you Google Tetrarchs, you will find the picture I'm talking about. It was plundered from Constantinople in 1204 by the Venetians in the Fourth Crusade, and it's a porphyry sculpture portraying four men standing together, clasping each other's shoulders. It is striking because it completely lacks the grace and elegance of classical art, and yet it is also a very powerful representation of unity and comradeship. Wearing the flat cloth caps of the late Roman army, these men could have come straight from the battlefield. They exude a tough determination to uphold Rome's authority that is strikingly different from, say, the easy confidence shown in the sculptures of old Rome, for example, the Prima Porta statue of Augustus. Now, the Tetrarchy was designed to overcome the military anarchy of the 3rd century when the legions proclaimed 26 emperors in 50 years from 235 to 285, an average of one every two years. This military anarchy, as historians call it, was due to the army's division into three main troop concentrations, the Rhine, the Danube and Syria, with each one believing it was entitled to appoint the emperor. The Roman civil wars in the 3rd century mostly resulted, in fact, from conflict between these Roman armies. Or they could simply break away from the empire, as happened with the Gallic Empire, which was in essence the Rhine army splitting itself off from the rest of the empire. And the problem was one emperor could not be in three places at the same time. 
So Diocletian wanted to have military commanders located in the three different regions who shared a common purpose and interest. So far in the 3rd century, this had only been achieved with a dynastic solution by appointing members of the same family to the key positions, such as when the Emperor Valerian had appointed his son Gallienus to rule in the West while he dealt with the Persians. While this had actually worked reasonably well until Valerian was captured by the Persians, dynastic solutions were not common because family members were often simply not available or or just not the right people for the job. So Diocletian tried an experiment that, while not providing a lasting solution, did solve the political instability during the 21 years of his reign. And he began this by dividing power between him and a close army colleague and a friend called Maximian. Maximian ruled in the west, Diocletian in the east. Maximian was clearly the junior of the two. He was appointed a Caesar in 285, while Diocletian was the more senior called an Augustus. However, Diocletian trusted him enough to raise him to the rank of Augustus the next year, which was theoretically his equal, although no one was in any doubt that Diocletian was still the real boss. And this worked well since Diocletian and Maximian were a genuine team. In the West, Maximian kept the Alemanni, Burgundy, Franks at bay on the Rhine, as well as defeating rebellious Gallic peasants known as the Bagaudi. In the East, Diocletian concentrated on securing the Danube frontier against the powerful Sarmatian tribes, who he defeated in 289 and 292, as well as defending Egypt against African invaders called the Blemis, Syria against the Arabs, and he also secured Armenia against the Persians. Indeed, it was so successful that Diocletian decided to go a step further and to divide the empire into four parts. And this was the beginning of the Tetrarchy, which means four in Greek. And this began when Diocletian made a further division of this imperial rule with Maximian by appointing two subordinate styled Caesars to assist both him and Maximian. And these were Constantius in the west and Galerius in the east. Constantius was given Gaul and Britain, while Galerius was given the Danube frontier. And what seems to have made the Tetrarchy work so well was the recognition by the other Tetrarchs of Diocletian's overall authority. And to achieve this, Diocletian certainly did not hold back on ostentation to emphasise his authority. For example, he wore a gold crown and jewels, Citizens had to prostrate themselves in his presence. The most privileged were only allowed to kiss the hem of his robe. Such regal behaviour would have offended Romans in the past, as the historian Edward Gibbon, an Enlightenment thinker, noted when he compared it with Augustus's more subtle manipulation of power. Quote, like the modesty affected by Augustus, The state maintained by Diocletian was a theatrical representation, but it must be confessed that of the two comedies, the former was of a more liberal and manly character than the latter. It was the aim of the one to disguise and the object of the other to display the unbounded power which the emperor possessed over the Roman world." But, in spite of that, it worked. During his reign, 
the empire did not dissolve into breakaway entities or suffer from debilitating army rebellions, and the army itself was kept under strict control without imperial assassinations. The only internal dissension lay with the breakaway Roman governor of Britain, who was called Carausius. Carausius had set up an independent state in Britain and northern Gaul, similar to Posthumus's Gallic Empire in the 260s to 270s. Britain was still fairly prosperous, having suffered little from the 3rd century invasions that had devastated Gaul, and so it provided a formidable power base. Although the sources are pretty vague, it seems Maximian failed to defeat Carausius in both 288 and 289, after which Diocletian ordered Constantius his Caesar, to launch a full-scale invasion of Britain, which he did successfully in 296 and brought Britain back into the empire. Elsewhere in the empire, another attempt at breakaway was made in Egypt in 296 by an adventurer called Domitianus, who hoped to profit in particular from resentment in Egypt to Diocletian's tax reforms, which we've covered in the previous episode and which were broadly accepted in the rest of the empire. This time it was Diocletian himself who crushed the rebellion even sacking the important city of Alexandria, which had sided with the rebel. Diocletian's tetrarchy certainly ended the vicious cycle of civil war within the empire, but there was one aspect of society that was still in turmoil. And in this respect, Diocletian made his greatest mistake, and one that would lead to his vilification for centuries to come. This was the persecution of the Christians. In AD 298, Diocletian and his Caesar, Galerius, were sacrificing to obtain omens before an intended Persian war. The soothsayers examined the entrails but were perplexed by the condition of the animals' livers. Fresh animals were sacrificed. Again, the entrails appeared unsatisfactory. The chief soothsayer, a man called Tagus, suddenly declared that the problem was caused by the presence of non-believers. It emerged that some of the officials present were Christians and had been defending themselves against the demons involved in these pagan rituals by crossing themselves. Diocletian was apparently furious and ordered that all Christians serving in the army or civil administration be made to sacrifice or be discharged. According to the Christian chroniclers Eusebius and Lactantius, this was the first step towards the great persecution. However, the sources are not consistent about how Diocletian progressed from a relatively benign instruction to dismiss Christians if they would not sacrifice to a proper persecution. If anything, they suggest that he was more conciliatory than his junior tetrarch, Galerius, who was a strong opponent of Christianity and very influential over Diocletian, especially as Diocletian's health began to fail. What is recorded is that the persecution began on the 23rd of February, AD 303, in Nicomedia, Diocletian's eastern capital near the Bosphorus. Within sight of his palace, the Christians had built a church. Early that morning, on Diocletian's orders, Roman legionaries marched to the wooden door with a battering ram. They smashed it in, and once inside, they seized the church ornaments and set alight the scriptures they found. Then more legionaries brought up a catapult and began to hurl stones against the stone walls. Soon the church was reduced to a battered, burning shell under Diocletian's watchful eye as he followed the spectacle from his palace. 
The next day, an edict was published in the city. A wooden board was put up near to the demolished church, saying that throughout the empire, Christian churches were to be demolished and sacred vessels confiscated. Bibles and liturgical books were to be surrendered to the authorities and publicly burnt, and assemblies for worship were prohibited. If this was not enough, there was also a requirement for all Christians to sacrifice to the gods of the empire. If they refused, they would be expelled from all civil offices and could lose their civil rights. When a Christian called Euthius tore down the edict, shouting that such orders were what he expected from Goths and Sarmatians, not the Roman emperor, soldiers arrested him and charged him with treason. He would not repent and continued to mock the emperor. In the main forum of the city, the soldiers drove nails into his hands, and when he would still not repent, they tied him to a stake and burnt him alive. He was the first martyr in what would become known as Diocletian's great persecution. Many more followed, although initially at least it seems that Diocletian wanted to avoid bloodshed by simply closing down the meetings and central rites of the Christian church. But the problem was the intransigence of the Christians themselves, especially when it came to being forced to sacrifice to the empire's pagan gods, as they called them. Sacrifice was an intrinsic and long-established part of Roman and Greek life, and to Diocletian and most of the non-Christian Roman society, this was something that had to be enforced on the Christians. As Christian resistance grew, a second edict was published, which proclaimed that all of the Christian clergy were to be imprisoned. Soon, bishops and deacons joined murderers and grave robbers in the empire's primitive and overcrowded prisons. With chaos in the prisons, Diocletian relented for a moment and ordered, in a third edict, the release of the Christian clergy, but on condition that they made a sacrifice before being released. In the face of continued opposition from the clergy, Diocletian issued a fourth edict that all Christians must be made to sacrifice forthwith and were to be punished if they did not, although the death penalty was not specifically required. Implementation of this policy seems to have been very mixed. Apparently, some governors, in particular in Africa, Egypt and Syria, took it into their own hands to implement it harshly. The result could be horrific in these provinces, as described by one Christian chronicler. Quote, Things were done to Christians in Pontus that would make you shudder. Pointed reeds were driven under the fingernails of both hands, lead was melted over a fire, and the boiling, seething mass poured down their backs, roasting their bodies. End quote. However, many historians think Christian chroniclers exaggerated the horrors, and the persecution was less severe than they like to make out. Certainly, in most of the Western Empire, especially Gaul and Britain, the evidence suggests the edicts were largely ignored, and most Christians escaped unscathed. Interestingly, when persecution was particularly savage, some sources suggest it actually encouraged sympathy for the Christians. Whatever really took place, the persecution was short-lived. Diocletian displayed little enthusiasm for it, suggesting it was probably Galerius and other ministers who were really behind it. Beginning in 303, by 305 it was effectively over, for it was superseded by an extraordinary announcement. Diocletian said he would retire. He was the first and only Roman emperor ever to do this. The reason was his failing health. In 303, he had celebrated the 20th anniversary of his reign with his co-emperor Maximian in Rome. It was his only visit to the city he despised. But he contracted an illness that got worse. He was carried in a litter to his capital at Nicomedia. In 304, 
there were rumours that he had died, but in March 305 he reappeared in public, looking emaciated and barely recognisable. In May that year he called his army commanders and regional governors to the same hill he had stood on 21 years earlier when the army had proclaimed him emperor. Yet this time he faced his soldiers with tears in his eyes and told them he was too ill to continue as emperor. He thus became the first and only emperor to abdicate voluntarily. He would spend the next six years growing prize-winning cabbages in his huge palace fortress, which can still be seen in modern Split in Croatia. But Diocletian's plans for a smooth succession went badly wrong. One problem was that since he had no son, there was no possibility of hereditary succession. Instead, with both he and his co-Augustus Maximian retiring in 305, the two junior partners of the Tetrarchy, Galerius and Constantius, succeeded them as the new co-Augusti, the senior emperors within the Tetrarchy. But perhaps because he was frustrated at not having his own son to pass power too, Diocletian also refused to allow either Maximian's son Maxentius or Constantius's son Constantine to become the junior emperors in the Tetrarchy. Instead, he chose two of his favourite generals, Flavius Severus and Gaius Galerius Maximinus, to be the junior emperors. This was the first sign of poor judgment from Diocletian since the result was a return to civil war, this time between the Tetrarchs. In 311, Diocletian died. The Tetrarchy had failed. Some said he died in despair. Others that he died content, no longer caring about the empire. But the Roman Revolution was just getting going as Diocletian's Tetrarchy disintegrated. A young man called Constantine was proclaimed emperor of Britain, Gaul and Spain by the Roman army in York in Britain on the 25th of July AD 306. This man would prove to be yet another revolutionary. One of his first acts was to prohibit Christian persecution in his territories. He did not stop there. 31 years later, by the end of his reign in AD 337, not only was Christianity the empire's favoured religion, but he ruled it from a new capital city, Constantinople. And that ends this episode. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, of course, I'd be delighted for any quick ratings or reviews on whichever podcast app you use. And I'd like to point out that the next episode will be in two weeks' time, since I'm taking a break next week, and it will be on the rise of the Christians. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. (laughs) 